What's going on guys? My name is Hussein and in today's video we're going to explain what's the difference between an index scan and an index only scan. How about we jump into it? So I have here a Postgres database and I have PSQL and uh, I have a beautiful table here with no indexing or anything like that, right? So I have an ID, a grade and a name, the students, so like a bunch of students table, very simple table. Right. So what I want to select here, for example, if I select the name where uh, uh, from grades where ID equals seven, you can see that this particular person's ID seven is named Hussein. And if I do like select star from grades where ID equals seven, you can see that the grade is 81. It's all boring stuff. So what we're going to look at as, as database engineer, we're interested in the what the database did to fetch this row. So we do explain, analyze, and we do the same query again. Select name uh, from grades where ID is equal seven. And since there are no indexing on the predicate on ID equal seven, the database decided to do the only thing it knows. Where, which word? Parallel sequence scan, which is the table scan, which goes to the table itself and just literally one by one search every single row pulls it and then look is it id7 nope let's look at the second one is it id7 nope until it finds the id7 right and uh, it took 400 milliseconds to do that and it returns uh, one row essentially that that's how we're, we, we should look here right so that's that's what it did so now we know how to create an index on this id because it's powerful stuff so if i do create index uh, id index on grades and let's say on the id field right so this way we're going to create a b3 index so that searching is a little bit faster and that's a completely different structure from the table we talked about this table that has i think uh, 10 million students right so now we just created another table given that id that beautiful tree so that it's uh, way better in searching we can search that uh, in, in that index in a very different way than we're searching a huge table. So let's do the same exact thing on this table. And just like that, we went from 300 for 400 millisecond to one millisecond in the index. And we look at this, it says index scan. I wanna dif differentiate between index scan and index only scan. We're gonna come to that next. It is an index scan because yeah, we use the index which is called ID index to search for ID seven. And we quickly found out that, however, what's not mentioned here is we had to go back to the table to actually fetch the value name, because that's what we're asking for. We're asking for the name of the student, right? And the name of the student is not in the index. The only value in the index are the IDs. And we found the ID, but we had to go back to the table. So that table structure we talked about, the one we scanned earlier, it's there. And we had to go back using the reference, the row reference of the table to jump back to that table, fetch that ID number seven and fetch that whole row. That includes the name, the grade, and uh, pretty much any other columns as well in the table itself. Beautiful stuff. So... If I change this query a little bit, guys, and I asked only for the ID, does the database need to go to the table? The answer is no, because the ID is right there. Obviously, this is a silly query, right? Because the value is seven. But look at this. It says now index only scan. That is powerful. It says index only scan because it did not have to go to the table. And that, if you can execute queries in your application so that they are index only scan, you hit the jackpots. Index scan are great, are nice, but index only scans, ooh, they're the beautiful. However, this is a silly query. How do we make this a little bit more useful? Here's what I'm gonna do, guys. There's something called non key columns, where, where uh, as we create indexes, and I created, and, and I, I actually made a video about this topic, check out it here, but we can drop our index. Let's go ahead and drop our index. And we're going to recreate our index, id, idx, on grades, 
on the ID. However, while we're creating that, I know that most of my queries, when I query for the ID, are asking for, for example, the grade or for for the name i barely ask for the grade i only ask for the name for example so i'm gonna actually include the name field in this index this is called a non-key column this is a, called a key column this is what we're gonna search against this is what we're gonna fetch from the in, uh, from the index right so it's not it's not gonna be using this for for optimization or searching this is just what we're gonna store in the index so we can pull the information very efficiently so now if i do this i'm going to create a brand new index same exact index what did what the difference is we now pulled the values from the entire table the name into the index just the name column so now if i do the same exact query and i'm not going to ask for the id i'm going to ask for the name what do you think is going to say that the planner the planner is going to say index only scan beautiful why because we asked the database hey find me id number seven student with id number seven but go back and give me the name the database is like, oh, wait a second. i'm not gonna go back to the table that huge 10 million scary table i'm saying right there the name is actually in me in the index so there you go just return it so that's why it took much much faster to execute beautiful powerful stuff so now if i change this from name to grade that's no longer an index only scan it's an index scan different why the grade is not available in the index so we had to go back to the table and fetch the row and we took the hit in order to fetch the grade so guys this is what I wanted to explain in this video, guys. And uh, be to pay attention to the cost of these things, guys. Because as we work more with a, with a large index, and including non-key columns in the index, can actually uh, increase the, the size of the index. And if you increase the size of an index, that could be really bad right because the more the size the bigger the index the 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 slower it gets to query it because you had to fetch more and more pages to get into the things that you're looking for so just be careful of that just uh, have an idea of what 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 your query looks like what your structure looks like in this video i want to go through some of the best practices that you can create indexes with uh, so that you can gain the best performance for your queries i'm going to execute four different queries on this beautiful table that I have here. Uh, I have a table with three integers, uh, A, B, and C, and I'm gonna play with the indexes on A and B. So I'm, I'm gonna create a configuration where I have an index on both A and B. I'm gonna create a, a configuration where I have a composite index on A and B, and I'm gonna create a different kind of configuration where I have a composite index and a normal index on B. All right, and I'm going to execute the following queries where I'm going to query only on A and I'm going to query only on B and I'm going to query A and B and query on A or B because that's a, most of the stuff that we do on the back end. We query with these particular filters. I understand we have end statements, we have other kind of aggregates, but we'll take it step by step. I hope you learned something useful with this video. With that said, let's just jump into this and play with this thing. All right, guys, so let's start with creating an index on A and another index on B. So I'm going to create an index on test A. By the way, I think I have uh, around uh, 12 million rows in this table. Not much, but enough for us to uh, experiment with. So I'm going to create another index on B. All right, all done. Let's test. So we have an index on a and an index on b so let's, let's check our queries so the first query i want to do is select c from test where a is equal 70 and uh, i'm going to prefix this with explain and analyze that will tell us how much the analyze take talk and the plan that has been used in order to do this thing how about we jump into it do it fast fast to this very fast though all right, so what happened? 
obviously the Postgres decided to use the index. However, it created a bitmap in order to query this index because there are a lot of rows. Look at how many rows. We have 900, 9,000 rows. So it has to create a bitmap. Why? Because we have to jump back to the heap to pull C. C is not in the index. C is not included in the index. So we have to jump back to the heap to pull the value of C right after locating that so we are building a map of all the values the row the tuples in order to jump back to the table and pull that and that explains why we have a bitmap index scan scanning the index itself that we just created on a and then we jump back to the heap to actually pull those rows and we have a cost took 253 milliseconds not that bad all right so that's that's what we have done and what i want to do here i'm show you that uh, we can easily change this uh, uh, kind of infer the decision of postgres by actually limiting the number of queries so if i say okay give me only two queries back two rows back look what the postgres decided to do because we have only two rows came back the postgres doesn't need to take the overhead to build a bitmap because building a bitmap takes a little bit of time right you have to compile this structure you have to come up with all values but it says oh i only found two rows i don't need to build a bitmap so it decided to do an index scan a clean index scan especially that these rows are are contiguous they are ordered they are sorted so the values that i'm gonna get i don't need i don't need a map for this i, I just can go pull the uh, those values directly from the heap all right so we use the index how about to go to the other query my other query is b is equal 100 so I'm still pulling c what where b is equal 100 let's take a look so it took 250 millisecond we also use the index this time we use the b index because yeah i'm querying on b naturally i'm going to use the index on b and then i hit the table directly with a heap scan using the values that i picked up from b all right usually this is also a bad idea right because you're not going to pull 10,000 rows what are you going to do with 10,000 rows and unless you're doing some sort of aggregate that's a different story but all right so we have the value so we're using the index all right so let's do this uh, the query now but we're going to query on both a and b so i'm going to do a equal i don't know 100 and b is equal to 100 Let's, let's see what, what, what Postgres decides. So now we're going to do an AND between those squares. So Postgres decides, says, okay, in parallel, I'm going to scan the A index. I'm going to scan the B index because you, you gave me two values, right? And scanning those two values, I'm going to scan them and I'm going to build a bitmap, right? And literally, you've got a bitmap and then literally just AND those bitmaps. You're going to end up with a certain values. Right, some values will, will zero up, some values won't. And then you're going to end up with a set of tuples that you're going to hit the heap and pull the table directly. And that's extremely fast, right? As you can see, it's just happened is like how, how many values did you really return, right? We returned six rows. That's why it's pretty fast. And the ANDing operation is extremely fast as well. So that's what Postgres do in case of an AND. So let's try an OR. What would an OR do? I'm just going to change this to an OR. Boo! With an OR, it took obviously longer, and that explains a lot, obviously, because OR always brings more rows than AND, right? And now we did exactly the same. We scanned this index, we scanned this index, we brought the bitmap, we uh, ORed them, got a lot more rows than we, uh, what we wanted, and then we got back the results. So pay attention to what this really happened right we're doing double the work we're doing scanning this index scanning index and going to the table giving it those these rows and then going to the table to pull these rows all right all right so now i'm gonna drop these uh suckers and i create a composite index instead let's do that test a idx test b all right both the indexes dropped now what i'm gonna do is create a index on test a b so this is a composite index a little bit different right so we have one index that have both values so it's going to take longer to create 
and it's going to be more efficient for queries that have both a and b especially the and cases right because the and cases we did a lot of work and guys don't pay attention to the values that um, the, the, the how long it took because this is really depends on the machine depends on so many things i want you to pay attention to how much work postgres do and that's what i'm explaining essentially all right let's do the query, first query on this so now i'm gonna only query against a and let's see what we're gonna do look at that actually postgres uh, decided to use the a b index despite me querying on a why because a was on the left hand side when i created that at, and that dang that matters because it's on the left hand side the values can be easily scanned that's the postgres rule you can scan the values from the left but you cannot scan them right just the index are built left to right right and uh, when you build that query the index decided to use uh, the postgres decided to use the index and then jump back to the heap right so it took two to 50 millisecond to find all those values right and i believe if i do a limit let's say limit 10 as you can see it's an index scan instead of a beta beat bitmap so it's like a little bit faster all right let's do the b what do postgres do when i do a b 100 Ooh, you felt that huh it's a parallel sequence scan why postgres will not use the index why because you cannot use this composite index when you're scanning a filter that is not the left hand side it's either a and b or a you cannot use b so be very careful so if you have a composite index on a and b querying on b will not use the index so what the table does what postgres does is just jump directly to the table and does a full table scan and using multiple worker threads to do that right so it's obviously very very slow so very careful be, be very careful for that all right what happens if I do A and B? A equals 70 and B equal 80, whatever values. Look how fast this thing is. 0.5, half a millisecond. This is absolutely insane. That is the best case scenario. If you really, all the time, if your queries are all the time like this, have a, a value and value, it's a great to create an index, composite index if if the, if you if your application only does that and hopefully only does that and you're all, also you're querying an a best case scenario is to create a composite index yeah it's more costly to create a composite index compared to a single index because it stores more values obviously right but the performance is remarkable right all right how about or how about or this or the scar oh nope <laughs> or in or all bets are off you cannot use any of the indexes right i mean postgres decided in this case it's useless for me to query and try to use that because like you know what might be faster for me just to go and jump to the uh, table scan do a full table scan instead so that's what postgres did and postgres does uh, most databases do all these decisions on, on behalf of us right like, okay maybe it's better to do this versus do this i mean if you look at this it's like okay you have an index on a you can query on a i mean you have an index on a and b but you can query you can use the index for a but postgres decided no you know what it's way slower i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do a bitmap and then go for b i don't have an index so anyway i have to go jump there and uh, do the uh, full scan anyway right what happened if i do a limit limit one sequential scan on this it's not even parallel it's just sequential because we know we're going to pull only first row that's fast and uh, that's directly on the heap all right all right guys the first final thing we want to do is we know what well, we know that b suffered queries on b suffered when i have a composite index so what i'm going to do here is uh, show you that i have a composite index on a and b what i'm going to do is create an index on test b in addition to this index and then execute the same queries again and see how things are doing all right so what will happen now if i query on a 
we saw this because we're going to use the composite index that's fine that's fast right that's nice right how about if i use b if i use b now oh we're going to use your beautiful index that you just created for us. So that's kind of a compromise as you as a backend engineer, as your database engineer. You can also, okay, I, my, some queries, uh, I'm going to use the B to query this. So I might need an index there, right? So you're going to create an index in this case to speed up these queries, right? And then obviously we're going to hit the table and, uh, and the heap in order to do that. All right let's do a and b a and b absolutely genius and fast look at this right we're going to use the composite index because the b right right how about a or b oh or now that we have an index on b and an index on a b now postgres is, oh wait a second actually we have an index on b i can query uh, the index on b do a build a bitmap and then i can query since we're querying on a i can still use the composite index because it's a left hand side i can use the query uh, uh and the index on that build my bitmap beautiful bitmap build a single bitmap jump to the heap and then pull the rows that i want all right guys that was uh some of the best practices that you can do to work with indexes right this is just just some of them right guys sometimes indexes can shoot you in the foot sometimes they are great but just learn how to use them uh, i i can't possibly in 10 minutes explain all possible combinations but hopefully this helps you kind of understand what the database is doing when you actually acquiring the indexes this is very very critical as a backend engineer this is one of the skill set that you have to put in your build when you're building a, a database in this video we'll look through how the database optimizer decides which index to use especially if there are multiple indexes uh, this is very useful if you want to know whether your table needs an extra index or not because if you have multiple indexes how do you know which index the database is going to use is not going to use all of them all the time it really depends this video is going to explain these kind of different kind of cases right this video is not going to discuss the combined indexes you know one index that have multiple columns right because i already discussed that so let's say we have a beautiful table with just two columns f1 f2 column one has an index uh f1 idx and column 2 has an index f2 idx and we're going to do a select star from ta the table where f1 equal 1 and f2 equal 4 so let's go through some scenarios to see how the database optimizer decide to a should i use f1 index or f2 index there are so many ways to solve this to look for these values right so let's take a little case number one Case number one is when the database optimizer decides to use both of them. So what it does, it, it queries F1 IDX looking for the value one in this case, finding all the row IDs that matches and tuples in case of Postgres, row IDs in case of Oracle and SQL Server. And it collects all these row IDs. And then it does the same exact search but with the value four on f2 idx so it searches and collects a different set of row ids and in case of an and it will essentially do an intersection it's like okay what is the values that are in here not in here and then uh, essentially merges the results and or it's going to merge the result and essentially union them right so that's that's how it does it. the effective result set the row ids are are collected that's the final result you go to the table if necessary obviously and you collect the actual values from the table from the heap right so when does it actually do this it really depends if the values are not too small if, they, if we know that we're not going to get so little of a result because if we're going to get a little of a result it's not worth searching both indexes one is enough right especially in case of an end right these cases gets really tedious right and if we get too large of a result, if we know that the index is going to turn so many rows, so many row IDs, it's just not worth looking through the index. In this case, we're going to go through the table index scan, right? So it really, really depends on uh, 
And that's all heuristics the database uses to decide with whatever this, right? So that's case one. So let's talk about case two. The case two is when the optimizer decides to use one index over the other. So let's take an example. We're going to show an example right here. Uh, the database decides to use F1 index only, search all the rows for the value of one, and then we collect all the rows and then don't use the second index, right? Let's just go immediately to the table, fetch those rows, and then do a recondition, refilter the results based on F2 equal four, right? So databases do usually do that when they know that F2 index returns so many rows while f1 returns very few rows and the condition is an end because if i know it's an end then i know of course i'm gonna go with the smaller one because anything that doesn't match f1 right is out of the result set right so it's gonna go with f1 example is a primary key if i have a primary key the database almost always gonna use the primary key index in case of an end again or then or it's a different situation right because you get more results right and then go back to the table directly and fetch the results we want to right it's just not worth searching two indexes because b trees are not cheap guys and, and even LSS, lsm trees are not cheap indexes are not cheap to search yeah if you're searching if you know that you're gonna get so so few of the values then it's worth searching the index if you know that you're gonna get a lot of rows back then it's not worth searching the index and maybe table scan is actually better. And you might say, how do you know? How does the database know that, hey, this index is going to result so many rows versus this search is going to result into fewer rows? Well, there's something called the statistics. The stats, real, really powerful. The database keeps stats of the table, says, okay, here's the table. Here's approximately how many rows there. Here's approximately how many ones are there. Here's approximately how many... Uh, threes are there and, and all these kind of values so they are not 100 percent correct but they give really a lot of values and you can also always update these statistics with a command called analyze or sometimes it's called, i think gather statistics and oracle right so that's the idea okay really again depends on an and or an or here but here's one example where we use one index over the other right just one and then filter so an index with a filter, that's case two. And case number three is just the database decides, you know what? You guys suck. Both indexes suck. I'm not gonna... The search to get for the value F1 equal one and F2 equal four is just gonna return the whole table, almost the whole table, three quarter of the table. I did my math and this is what I think. So guess what? I'm not gonna use both of you. I'm going to already go to the index because I need to go there anyway, because I'm going to select other columns. The database decides to search. Uh, the search will lead so many rows. Just like, let's go to the table directly and do filter because it's much cheaper. And some databases like Postgres does a threading, multi-threading, and uh, issues so many workers. So you can do uh, multiple workers to, to scan the table, right? So table statistics are very, very critical here. So if you got some wrong result, right let's say here's where, where things uh, get nasty sometimes <laughs> I, I got bit so many times with this here's an example you bring a table very fresh table right empty right so there is statistics almost zero it knows that hey table's empty you insert one row you insert th two rows three rows and then the tables get up updated every asynchronously right now it knows it has only three rows and then you do an operation to insert 3 million rows or 300 million rows. You j just in bulk. And you're just immediately after you insert it, you just do queries. You know what will happen in this case? The database, if you don't update the statistics, it will, you'll execute some, something like this and will say, hey, what should I do? Let's look, let's look at the statistic. Oh, this table has only three rows. So <laughs> it's always easier to scan it uh, fully. And in this case, it's going to do a full table scan, pulling all the 300 million rows to look through this. I've been, I've got bitten so many times by this because I forgot to update this or immediately I, I did my queries after this. So always, 
if you're using Postgres, do analyze. Uh, what's the other command? Vacuum, full vacuum to clean up all that garbage. And then uh, and then after that, just do an analyze. In, in, in Oracle, use gather statist schema statistics and SQL Server. I forgot what's the correct execute planner. I forgot what's, what it's called for the SQL Server. But yeah, you can do all these kind of stuff, guys, essentially. And for those who want to advance stuff, if you know what you're doing, if you really know what you're doing, you can use database hinting. You can, in the queries, include uh, some sort of a comments, like this one, the one you see on the screen, to kind of force the database to say, hey, you database, you're dumb. You don't know anything. Please trust me. I want you to always use the index of F1 or use the index of F2. Because I have more knowledge than you do because of certain situation, right? Because my application, I know what I just did. You are not uh, caught up to what I just did as, an, uh, as a database. So trust me, your stats are not up to date to what I'm about to do. Plus, maybe the human in this case are, are way smarter than machines, right? And, and, unless the AI picks up anytime soon. I don't know. I don't think it, it will but anytime soon so it was gonna take time all right guys uh, that's it for me today very quick video talking about how these databases use the indexing very very critical again i miss uh, i i omitted so many details for example so we'll give we'll give this uh uh, we'll, we'll, we'll open up for questions and we'll have some discussions on, on what if there is an or if there is a join, it completely changed the dynamic, right? This, the building a database is not something easy. It's really, really difficult. But these tools will help you while you're executing a query. At least you know, hey, I know that if one is not going to have a lot of value, it's going to have, uh, let's say, it's going to have a lot of values. Let's say you have one, two, three. That's only the unique values you're going to have, right? Or, uh, I don't know, let's, let's take a, good, a real example. Um, let's say you're building a customer database, right? And you have the states, right? In the United States, like California, Texas, whatever. All of them, right? And let's say your database is almost exclusively all people from California, right? And you have an index on the state field. Obviously, if all of them are California, that's just that's just a useless index right there. Because like, what what is gonna give me is so if I search where state is equal to California, that's the entire table, right? So, but let's say you have three customers on Texas and one from Florida. Searching that one, that Florida, is way faster than searching the 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 three hundred million. Uh, no, three hundred million. That's the entire United States. But you get the idea, right? If you have one value or few values, indexes are beautiful for this, right? But if you have so much rows that you're coming back, that's where you play the game of multiple indexes. Okay, you know what? I know that this row, this index is going to give me this much rows back. I'm going to slash it down with another index. So let's put that. But you have to think of how sparse your table looks like right creating an index on a production database especially on the large table can take a long time and not only that but it also blocks edits on your tables so you cannot really write writes are blocked when you, when you want to perform these kind of operations so which kind of sucked right you can do reads just fine right for example select from grades where uh, IDs less than 10, that works, you can read, but you cannot really write because the index is using that field, that particular field to build the index, right? So that kind of sucks. So Postgres came up with a better approach to create index called create index concurrently. And this is what I'm going to show in this video. Go ahead and drop this index and do the concept of creating the index concurrently so we can allow write and read while the index is being created, which is very very variable right you cannot afford going down or uh, uh, posing or locking transactions when you when you're essentially creating an index on the production environment so we're going to do the same thing create index g on grades on the field g but we're going to add a word concurrently what that will do is it will 
do multiple scans to perform them and it will wait for all the transaction the right transactions to finish before it actually and it will pause itself right while while there are right uh, there are right transactions so now if i want to insert into grades right values one for example i can do that can i read definitely you can read where id is less than that's totally fine you can commit and you can read right however what this will do because of the multi multiple scans because of the waiting right that this operation is going to take way 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 longer obviously compare it's going to consume more cpu obviously and it's going to consume more memory so it might take some of the cpu precious cpu memory from other processes however not only that it can also potentially fail guys right because consider if this index is essentially a unique index and you're inserting duplicate values what are the index didn't exist technically the index will end up in an invalid state and at that point you have to drop and recreate the index so this was create index concurrently very very useful tool and i heard that postgres is gonna make this the default right because when you create an index you don't really care if it takes a long time right you really care about your actual production live database writes and reads be fast right and and unblocked while in this case you want your index to be created and it's okay if it takes a little bit long so this was a very quick video talking about this new feature guys i'm gonna see you on the next one stay awesome goodbye bloom filters are one of those concepts that always confused me for the longest time in computer science i'm gonna take a few minutes to actually explain it to you guys and uh, not what are they but why do they exist so i'm gonna flip the question a little bit if you're interested stay tuned so here is a problem forget about bloom filters here's a problem today that we know how to solve but we can do it better i'm gonna write a service a web service express not js right that essentially check if my username exists or not and if you think about it a little bit this use this this capability this feature is very simple to build right build a database with all the usernames as you start writing your usernames if you want to build this interface you make a git request does paul exist you make a git request to the server express django anything and then you execute a query against your database select uh, username from this table hopefully you have an index there and if the if the record comes back that means the username exists if not then it doesn't exist right problem with this is very slow right and this feature is gonna be very popular right all these users going to this web page and typing hey does test one two three exist does whatever right everybody wants a fancy nickname right so here's the problem right this is very slow so what do we do well i heard about this redis thing right that is actually in memory database so let's take it from disk and put it in redis well that's fine we're gonna do the same thing execute the same git request but this time i'm gonna hit the database right and if it's not there okay i might sometimes need to go to the actual database because these two can get out of sync so you created some inefficiency and you actually doubled your memory footprint because you're storing data here and storing data here just to solve this simple problem okay so you we know how to solve this thing but some smart people computer science professors came up with a solution very efficient solution and they called it bloom filters so let's explain what these things are okay so with bloom filter we're gonna use some in-memory representation usually it's very tiny i'm using 64 bit in this case okay and this 64 bit magically have some numbers right in this case the bit zero is not set so it's zero this is one this is zero 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 and this is one right so how does it come up we'll come to that but here's the thing if we're gonna make a request hey does you does paul exist 
we will make a request to the server and in the server we'll write a function we will hash the string pool and mod it 64 and if you know mod what will happen is this result will only come back with a result from 0 to 63 right and just like that out of the box that you're gonna get collision all the time but that's fine so in this case poll is bit number three right and we if we go ahead and check in my integer in my 64 bit integer this is the filter that we built does this bit exist is it set no if it's not set then you can absolutely with 100 percent guarantee say that poll does not exist in the database because it's not set here and we're going to show how that uh, that happened okay so poll doesn't exist so i didn't have to even query the database let's take another example right where i'm going to check if jack exists i'm going to make a git request to the server and i'm going to mod that string jack i wish first of all we're going to hash the string jack get a bunch of big number right and then mod 64 i'm going to get a value from 0 and 63 it happened to be 63 i check the bit of 63 oh it's set and if it's set here's the thing if it's if that bit is set that means jack may be there and why is maybe maybe because there might be another string that matched hash and mod 64 that resulted in 63 and was set. Not necessarily Jack himself, right? But some other string that matched it. But that is actually enough for us. If it's set, then, well, it's set. I'm going to take the hit and hit the database. So I kind of saved myself some queries at the database. Is this perfect? No but it's a very efficient thing to actually query right to to prevent unnecessary querying by the way cassandra uses this in their uh, implementation of uh, consistent hashing all the time right the 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 ss tables and all that stuff they use this internally right because anything anytime you want to avoid an expensive query to check if something exists or not or or if you want to do a this query but you're not sure if you're going to get a result or not blue filters are very useful this there are some disadvantages to this but let's look at actually how to create a bloom filter i have a brand spanking new bit set here 64 bit right and i'm gonna create user jack for the first time it's a it's a blank database right there is nothing in it i'm gonna create jack so if i'm gonna create jack i am going obviously to make a post request to the server to the express server and i'm gonna hash jack mod 64 i am going to get 63 in this case and what do you do before writing to the database the username jack is you set this bit nice it is isn't it and then you obviously write it to the database so see this is how we start building this in memory representation of bloom bloom filter right and then let's try poll hey i'm gonna create a user poll poof post poll right mod 64 what do we get oh bit three let's set bit number three all right so far so far it's good let's try and and obviously we write it to the database let's try some other user tim well i'm gonna take tim and hash it mod 64 guess what i got number 63 again and that's absolutely perfect that's okay because you're gonna get you only have 63 bit 64 bits obviously all the strings and names in the war you will fill, fill between these things right and uh, obviously when you say 63 it's already set so you don't have to even bother yourself setting it because it's already set but you always have to head the database and write it all right so that's how, how it's actually made let's take another user ali all right so ali uh hash ali and get the six mode 64 you're gonna get bit number four in this case and you're gonna set that bit all right and then obviously write the database all right guys so that's essentially bloom filter in a nutshell I know the actual implementation of Bloom filters are a little bit fancier. They use like three locations and all that stuff, right? Sometimes they have 
they have more bits, right? They use three hash functions just to make the odds harder to get, right? But, and that's that's just to me, that's just an implementation. But if you, if you understand how it works, that's how it works. And that's why it exists, right? So some limitation of Bloom filter, you can get into a case where all of these puppies become one, 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 one. And in this case, you will, your bloom filter is essentially useless you you became the first case where you're always gonna hit the database it's not really harmful it's not gonna there it's not gonna slow you down but it's not gonna give you any benefit per se right so you're gonna have to think about this like the bigger you make this thing right then you kind of interfere with your memory footprint but I mean, it depends how big it is, right, really. But the shorter it is, then you're going to get all these false positive cases where you're going to always hit the database regard. What's going on, guys? My name is Hussein, and in this video, I want to discuss uh, the idea of working with a billion row tables in general. And this is a, a very, very interesting point because as you design a system, it will force you to ask a question your table design, your document design, whatever uh, flavor of a database you use, how do you anticipate these table to grow in the future? After one, three, four years, do you anticipate these tables to grow so large that they're gonna reach the billion uh, level? So in this video, I wanna kind of discuss how do we work with such huge volume of data, right? Because there are many ways of tackling this problem and I want to just discuss some of them. I have three concepts here to discuss. Obviously, guys, if I missed anything, let me know in the comment section below. Before we jump into the video, guys, this video was uh, basically inspired from my comment section, specifically with Vinny. He's a great database engineer and he always finds uh, mistakes and, and things that I say wrong and, and, and obviously has great feedback in general on all my videos. So I like, uh, this is just a shout out for him. So it was spawned as a discussion on my Twitter system design video when I came up with, with this arbitrary design to, for the fellow feature, which I'm going to reference the video right here. Go check it out. And so as a result, that design um, generated a table which is very very huge right so what i basically did is i have this following feature right so look, i have this person following this person so i put the whole thing in one table and add added two rows with their ids so this person following this table and and i said in the video this is gonna be a huge table so what do we do i'm the, we had a discussion back and forth of uh, how, what do we do with these kind of situation which inspired me to actually make a video to discuss what do we do what do people do today if you have a large table how about we discuss it so i have three basically concepts the first one is brute forcing your way to to process the table or work with the table so if you're trying to find a row inside this table right what you can do without the concept of indexing without the concept of anything brute force your way which is do multi-threading do multi-processing and chunk the table into multiple uh, segments and search in parallel right that's how basically uh, big data essentially and, and concurrent Hadoop works right so it's like map and reduce the subset of the table into smaller concepts so you can run in parallel and brute force your way and and find what you're looking for what uh, and, and try to do the process yourself right so that's the idea can i break this table into uh, hundreds of pieces and, and search these spaces in parallel concurrently throwing this problem on on uh, on a hundred uh, machine cluster that will work sometimes that's why i want to discuss the second point which is can i avoid processing the entire table can i avoid processing the entire table and instead process subset of this table only how do i do that 
the, the best best approach is use indexing right because that's what we do if we index a column on a table then you essentially create a structure on the desk that will basically it's a B, b tree or lsm tree that will help you reduce the subset on what you're searching so and instead of searching the entire table for what you want right you search only a small subset which is the index and that even it's its own it, it's a scan to find what you want and then you by finding that you you kind of narrow what you were looking for it's like a binder in, in in the secretary's office right where you have okay there is a book and there is the letter a and any contract that starts with a is is this any contract that starts with b is this any contract that starts with c is this so you see it in color coded right so if you if your contract is i don't know uh company is called zebra so you only immediately go to the z color and then you start searching right so you minimize what you're searching for however that's indexing so let's search with a smaller set right so instead of having the whole table let's reduce the set right so instead of working with a billion rows maybe we're working with few millions in this case right can i even go and reduce that set even more that's where database people do tricks like partitioning so partitioning is on disk by this huge table is now broken into and i'm talking about here uh essentially horizontal partitioning not vertical partitioning right so horizontal partitioning means like slice the table in half almost like in the middle and then you say okay rows from this to this is is on this location on desk right and then rows from this range to this range and in this location is different than indexing so the whole thing is still index but we're literally partitioning in uh, the table into multiple parts so now how do i know which partition to search for you need another concept that tells you which partition to hit and if you're lucky you might search one partition only or couple and this is called the partition key so you always partition on a key very similar to indexing except the indexing work on the whole table partitioning works also on the whole table but but it, it will partitioning will break down the table into smaller and smaller pieces and now you can you, you will have different indexes per partition usually the database take care of all that stuff for you so it's almost transparent working with indexes was working with with partition is transparent from you as a client who queries this table so it's incredibly fast right so if you know where to search for you can hit the right partition and only hoping that you the partition that you're searching for is in that and indexing also make that even smaller set so that's pretty cool right and that's still where so we have one database still we have uh one machine and we broken this into multiple partitions and now i can search exactly what i want to now you can distribute that even further across multiple hosts by doing sharding right so so similarly to the concept of partition you can still have partitioning and also add the idea of sharding on top of that which adds a little bit of complexity to your system but now you put the first hundred thousand customers in one database and you put the second hundred thousand in one database and they don't talk to each other and here's now the problem of transactions right because if they are two different databases you just reduce the size of the table obviously but now you complicated the client because the client is now should be aware of the shards like okay i am searching for customer number 500 which shard should i hit oh you hit shard one because that's where it is right and now going down deep into that shard there are partitions of that table and going down into each partition there are indexes right or index and now you just you basically narrowed the billion row into maybe few thousand or few hundred thousand 
roles, which is pretty good. So that's the idea of what we do, right? Shard, partition, and then index, and then find a row exactly what we're looking for. So that's the idea of, of, of limiting what we want to work with. And the final thing is, and, and, and uh, as I started thinking about it, it's like, okay, maybe we can avoid the, all this together. Why do you have a billion row table to begin with? So that's on the database designer, which was me in that case, right? It's like, okay, maybe it's not a good idea to have a table so large. Can we solve this problem so that I don't need to have a billion row table? And in case of the, of the, of the Twitter following example, we might actually be able to. I still didn't complete the thought yet, but if you have like a profile table, okay, okay, this is my ID, this is my name, this is my picture, we can add a field called followers count. It's an integer. We'll come to that. And now there is another field. Now most relational databases support JSON. We can put a JSON there or a list field and add your followers in your profile so now we don't have a relational table that tells you oh this guy is following this guy this guy is following this gal now we have one profile and if you want to get your followers then you go to your profile and fetch the row and and pull that information and that's you have all the profile and and every time someone follows you or some you follow someone now the hit is on the right level if i want to write hey someone just followed me i need to update those two columns i need to update the count and everything to that i didn't have this problem in the first design but the first design wouldn't scale as better as this in my opinion right you can now we, we start worrying about the right throughput but i don't want to go through that stuff right we can do message queues where we can okay let's write it asynchronously update that yeah there will be a little bit delay who cares it's a follower count anyway we're gonna pick the queue and then slowly just update these things so we have many ways to solve a problem so instead of to summarize the whole video instead of working with a whole billion table row Try first, concurrently process it, processing it. Maybe I'll flip that a little bit. Maybe try to avoid having a billion row. That's the first thing. I, I kind of said it last, right? The second one, if you can't avoid it, then can you index it? Obviously, what field to index them? Can you partition it, right? On the same table, on the same disk, right? Can you partition your table so that they are smaller sizes and if if you can partition and you can index, can you even if do you really need to shard it so that if it's even smaller and smaller smaller pieces on multiple hosts right because if that host dies then that's a problem right so you you even partition it on on horizontally essentially on multiple databases right shards that will create complexity which i try to avoid i talked about that a little bit and then finally if you can't do any of that stuff just do do map reduce do just run parallel processing and try to process run your work so that you process the billion row concurrently w with a massive army of machines if possible if your database is transactional then that's kind of pointless because the moment you start the army searching or, or working with your huge table partitioned right spliced then it will go out of there the moment you start because people are start editing right people changing all the time all right guys i'm gonna see you in the next one you guys stay awesome goodbye